All right, welcome everybody. We're gonna go ahead and get started today. Welcome to our celebration of $40 trillion divested from the fossil fuel industry. Um, just a couple of quick accessibility and logistics issues. Um, just wanna address real quick. Um, I wanna thank Esther um, who is joining us today for live transcript um, to access the closed captions um, down on the bottom right hand corner of your screen. Um, there is a closed caption button. Um, just click on that and you'll be able to access those across the bottom of your screen. Um, my name is Amy. Um, I'm the senior climate finance strategist at stand.earth. And I am very excited to be here today. Um, I wanna thank our um, staff member, Sarah, who will be adding links and calls to action to the chat. Um, and a big thank you to Michelle, um, who is our tech support today. Please feel free to use the Q&A function and the chat function um, throughout our time together um, this morning. Um, before we get started also, um, <clears throat> I invite everyone to acknowledge the land that you are on um, as we begin this session and important work. I would like to honor with gratitude the land itself and acknowledge that I am on the traditional homelands of the Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho tribes. When we talk about land, Land is part of who we are. It's a mixture of our blood, our past, our current, and our future. We carry our ancestors in us. They're around us, um, as you all do. Today, Indigenous people continue to protect and remain in relationship with these relatives and will do so until the end of time. It is vital to honor these beginnings and recognize the ongoing dedication and importance of Indigenous culture within our communities and within the land that we gather, live, and work on. It is important to understand the longstanding history that has brought you to reside on this land and to seek to understand your place in that history. Land acknowledgments do not exist in a past tense or a historical context as colonialism is a current ongoing process and we need to build our mindfulness of present participation. And why are we here today? We are here today um, together amidst it all um, to celebrate a major movement victory, fossil fuel divestment hits $40 trillion. So everybody give yourself a big round of applause. Um, I, I just wanna acknowledge that the last two years have been filled with struggles and grief, loss and heartbreak um, from the war in Ukraine, this week's IPCC report um, to increasing climate disasters and a global pandemic. Um, the powers that be are grasping at straws to hold on to the status quo, all in the name of profit and greed. While that's disturbing and heartbreaking, it's also a sign of our power um, that fossil fuel companies and their front groups, um, they're taking note of the power of divestment from a rise in greenwashing efforts to coal executive authored anti-divestment legislation they're grasping at straws to hold on to the fossil energy of the past. Um, only they're bargaining with our lives and um, our livelihood. Um, ahead of President Joe Biden's State of the Union tonight, we're gathered here today to celebrate the state of the divestment movement. <clears throat> and spoiler alert, we are more powerful than ever. Um, we've also seen the power of communities and movements rising up to build a world that puts our health and safety first. Um, from mutual aid networks to reinvestment, communities on the front lines of both climate change and COVID-19, together with our movements, are already building this new world. Um, through it all, we are here to celebrate, to hold one another in our joy and our grief, to center community, art, and music. Um, we're here to make space and to give our movements, communities, and ourselves um, the love and celebration that we deserve. So let's get this party started. Today, we're gonna to make sense of this $40 trillion milestone um, with some help of some amazing movement leaders. What does this mean? $40 trillion is the amount of total assets represented by the 1,500 institutions committed to some level of divestment. Total assets under management um, represents the total pool of potential capital being taken off the table for coal, oil, and gas companies. Um, and you can check out more um, at divestmentdatabase.org. We're going to share that link in the chat. Um, we flipped the switch on that this morning so that, that it reflects all current divestments, and we are a little over 40 trillion. If that feels like an unfathomable amount of money, um, you're not alone. It is. <laughs> for perspective, 
Um, $40 trillion would cover, um, that's just under half of the global GDP, the world, the entire planet's GDP. COVID vaccinations for everybody in the world, 800 times over. Climate damages in the US from the last five, through five years, 53 times over. And that would also cover 7,000 billionaire space rides. Um, these are some lofty numbers. Um, and let's consider the millions of people in communities all around the world who are mobilized into action through fossil fuel divestment. Um, so we want to hear from you, our participants today. We're gonna share a poll. Um, who here got involved or knows someone who got involved in the climate movement through divestment? Um, so we're gonna pop a poll in there um, and I'll raise my hand that I got involved through divestment. <laughs> and we're gonna pause for just a second while our participants take that poll. It should be popping up on your screen. All right, I'll give it a couple more seconds for folks to take the poll and then we'll share some results. All right, Michelle, whenever you're ready, we can share those results. Wow, nice. Lots of people got involved through divestment or they know someone that got involved through divestment. Very cool. Well, nice to see all those folks here. All right. Now we're gonna hear um, we're gonna hear from some movement leaders um, throughout today's celebration and beyond. Um, we want to hear from you. Like, what does forty trillion divestment movement milestone mean to you? Um, and feel free to share that. Um, drop your thoughts and visions in the chat or um, tag Standout Earth on social media. Um, so we're going to move into our speaker portion of today. Um, and with, uh, with that, I would love to introduce my very good friend, um, Bill McKibben from Third Act. Bill helped launch the divestment movement in 2012. Lots of us call him the papa of the divestment movement. And we say that with so much love um, and thankfulness for the mentorship. Uh, founder of 350.org and the author of the very first book um, for a general audience about climate change. He has recently helped launch Third Act, um, which is organizing Americans over 60 for climate action. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to my friend, Bill. Well. Look, Amy, thank you so much. Thank you for all your great work and everybody else for amazing work. Um, this is a kind of remarkable moment because we think back a decade uh, exactly to the beginning of the sort of big fossil fuel divestment movement. And at the time, it was not big. And it would have been presumptuous and silly to imagine that it would grow to anything like this scale. As we began it, our hope was that we could begin to take away some of the social license of these fossil fuel companies. And there's people on this call who will remember that first um, big uh, series of events across the country, the roadshow that we did in the autumn of 2012, uh, with thousands of people at each stop and the, the, the incredible desire of people to get engaged. The insight of this movement has been in part the fact that most of us don't live near a coal mine or an oil well, uh, but all of us are adjacent to a pot of money someplace. And so we could take this climate fight and spread it out all over the world. And that's precisely what's happened. There are none of us will ever know most of the people who've been engaged in this fight because there have been thousands on every college campus, in every church denomination. They've come and gone over the years. In many places, it took 10 years to get colleges to divest from fossil fuel, which meant we went through two and a half generations of undergraduates, and yet people kept fighting, kept pushing. 
I will say today that it's of course hard to have any kind of real celebration while we're looking at the pictures coming out of the Ukraine. And that just intensifies, should intensify all of our anger and our commitment at this most rogue of industries. Um, these are the these are the guys uh, at Exxon and Chevron and Shell and BP and everybody else who have enabled uh, Vladimir Putin to have the money that he needs to go try and crush other countries. Um, their constant uh, insistence on business as usual is the reason that he can still wield control of oil and gas as a weapon against Western Europe. Um, and they're continuing today to try and profit like vultures off this crisis, pushing not for what everybody knows would be sensible, a rapid conversion to renewable energy, but instead for um, um, more and more and more oil and gas drilling. Um, I remember in those first days of this, when we were doing those big road shows, one of the pictures that we showed was Rex Tillerson getting his prize from Vladimir Putin, his medal of the order of something or another there uh, in Russia. Um, um, and that, that made me sick to see it then and it makes me 10 times sicker now. So I'm incredibly glad that we've done this work that we've done and we have much more to do um, and, and, and going after not only the oil companies but the banks and financial institutions that support them. And uh, 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 what we've accomplished has been remarkable, unprecedented. I think there's no question this is the largest anti-corporate campaign of its kind in history. Um, it's in direct historical relationship to the remarkable anti-apartheid divestment campaigns of the 1980s. And that's a good reminder that we've lost some wonderful people along the way who've been a huge part of this fight. One of the very first people that we called to say, would this be okay to do this work was Desmond Tutu uh, in South Africa because he had spearheaded that anti, and he said, he said, not only did he say it was okay, he said, please, please do this. Uh, uh, climate change is the human rights issue of our time as apartheid was a generation ago. He not only encouraged us to do it, he became an active and powerful campaigner. And uh, I, I remember how happy he was when King's College London, one of his alma maters, uh, finally divested from fossil fuel. So um, we also have extraordinary gratitude to the people who taken what they learned in this movement and done wonderful things with it. I reflect constantly on the fact that so much of the Sunrise Movement uh, cut their teeth doing divestment work in college and then went on to bring us the Green New Deal and Build Back Better and the most effective political action we've seen on climate in Washington ever. So this movement has had extraordinary um, um, effects and it will have extraordinary effects going forward if we all keep it up. It is one way to be in solidarity with people suffering around the world today, which we all should be. Thanks so much to everybody here today. Thank you so much, Bill, for all those powerful words. That means so much to everyone um, in the movement. Um, and our, I would love to introduce um, our next speaker. I'm very excited um, to introduce Omar Elmawi um, from Stop ECOP. Um, Omar currently serves as, a, as the coordinator of Stop ECOP campaign, where he works with a myriad of organizations and in, individuals from Tanzania, Uganda, and the rest of the world to push for the protection of sensitive ecosystems, human rights, and address climate change concerns. He has also served as the coordinator of the Decolonize campaign, where he led um, to push for a green and sustainable energy future for Kenya. Uh, welcome, Omar. Thanks. Thanks, Amy. Um, definitely happy to be here. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, depending on where you are uh, on the globe. Um, I, I think for me, it's it's really an honor and, and I'm really excited to be part of this panel today to speak about this important uh, milestone that we've received, we, we've, uh, we've been able to achieve. Um, because, you know, five years ago, most, if not all of us, thought this task is a mountain that's impossible to conquer. Um, and today we are sitting here uh, and celebrating something that 
um, even the fossil fuel uh, uh, sympathizers and, 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 and proponents um, thought uh, we won't be able to, to pursue. So to us, um, this is not just 40 trillion that is a statistic or a number, it's lives and livelihoods that we are saving. Um, we know that we've shielded ourselves from theft of indigenous people's lands and resources. Um, and, and truly for us, um, we've, we've turned uh, a vision uh, into a reality. And, and I think we can only grow stronger going forward. So even those who disbelieved or were hopeless when we were starting this journey are now gaining their faith. And slowly and slowly, we are turning people into believers and they want to be more involved uh, in this important work. But at the same time, I think it's important for us to also note and understand that the fossil fuel sector and industry is fast. There's a lot of money that's being involved. And therefore, the people who are on that side are not seated and they're not just watching. They are also planning uh, in terms of how they are going to turn the tide on us um, and be moving things. Uh, into another direction. We are seeing most of the fossil fuel companies moving to the global south. I mean, a good example will be the East Africa crude oil pipeline and the associated projects that we are talking about. Single-handedly, this project, if it's, if it's going to see the light of day, it's going to be the world's longest heated crude oil pipeline. Um, and it's going to cause unprecedented impacts, not just to people, but also to nature and to the climate. And I think what's really was is that you know, these companies and fossil fuel companies have really known about climate change for a while. Um, and some have either ignored or even taken steps to try and, 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 and cons you know, lie to us about the reality of the issue while they continue doing the business as usual. And they've continued amassing more of the investments in fossil fuels. Um, and, and for us, I really, while we are celebrating, and it's important to do that, I think it's going to be unwise for us um, to think that this is won. Um, it's a battle that we've won, but the war is definitely far from over. I mean, there've been many empty promises we are seeing being scattered here and there by the prophets of fossil fuels. Uh, they're talking about net zero, they're talking about climate action, but we all know, you know that the people who really got us into this problem we are in today cannot be the people that are getting us out of it. And I would really encourage us to even call out these people uh, when they're using resources that they're getting from fossil fuels to continue investing in renewables. I mean, they cannot uh, two wrongs, they cannot make it right by saying they're now moving uh, to renewables. I mean, they've stolen many people's lands. People have lost lives and livelihoods. And I think we have to call them up and, and ask for climate reparations among other sanctions that we can call up upon them. But uh, aside from that, I think come tomorrow, we celebrate today, we have our drinks and wine and all the merry and dance and do everything that needs to be done because, you know, we've earned to be celebrating what we are doing today. I mean, this has not been an easy task. Having been involved in this sector for quite a good number of years, although I don't think Bill McKibben will consider it to be a good number of years, uh, but I know of the sweat, blood and tears that has gone into this work. And therefore, I would encourage all of us to really even push for more because we are reaching into um, a climate crisis and we're going there really quickly. And, and it's important for us to, to really push and see if we can get more. Finally, I will, re I will be remiss if I don't appreciate each and every one of you that are joining this call here today because your contribution, big or small, that has taken us to where we are today has been important. Um, and without it, we wouldn't have been here. I mean, we're talking about all those protests, petitions, civil disobedience, actions, writings, and different other things that we've all done have contributed to get us to where we are today here. And therefore I would say you've definitely, if anything, and my respect and admiration to the work that you're doing. And let me just end by saying cheers and let's keep the good fight. And back to you. Thank you so much, Omar. That was so beautiful. And yes, like absolutely, we are here to celebrate every single person that has contributed to um, this movement. 
Um, and our next speaker, I am very pleased to introduce um, Alethea Phillips um, from Earth Guardians. Alethea is an indigenous and environmental rights activist from the Omaha tribe of Nebraska and Iowa. At 22 years old, um, she serves as the lead organizer of Native Youth Alliance, which aims to create safe spaces, provides leadership training, and uplifts Indigenous youth, and is the program director for the Indigenous Leadership Initiative at Earth Guardians. She works to ensure Indigenous voices are heard in the discussion on climate change and has spent the past several years working within the Indigenous divestment and anti-extraction movements, and as a representative at the UN Indigenous Peoples Permanent Forum and as Sustain Us Delegate at the first ever all Indigenous delegation um, at COP25 in 2020. Welcome. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. Uh, I am calling in from occupied Anishinaabe lands in Michigan. Uh, and I just want to say thank you today for. I'm very happy to say that we're celebrating $40 trillion uh, divestment from fossil fuels. I would like to recognize that this is the direct result of the hard work and dedication of grassroots organizers that have been working to make this possible. This is the power of people holding their financial institutions accountable. Earth Guardians is proud to be part of the Stop the Money Pipeline Coalition, which for years has brought together indigenous, black, brown, and allied organizers together with a common goal to end fossil fuels. Through divestment, we have been able to not only pull money directly out of the extraction industry, but also the militarization that they have used against water protectors at the front lines of Standing Rock and Line 3. I would like to say thank you to each and every one of you for being part of this movement. Please follow Stop the Money Pipeline as we continue this work. And I want to say again, thank you to all of you for being a part of this movement. We blaha, thank you. Thank you so, so much. Um, beautiful, and yes, thank you to all of those folks. Um, next, I would like to introduce um, Reverend Avi Maha from Green Faith. Abby is Greenface director, director of Education, Training, and coordinates Greenface Climate Finance Campaigning. She has helped lead Fossil Free PCUSA for close to a decade, um, which recently celebrated the Presbyterian Church um, USA's forthcoming divestment commitment. Um, and Abby and her seven-month-old cutie pie, Juniper, live in Texas. Welcome, Abby. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, everyone. Again, I'm Abby Mohop. I use she, her pronouns. I'm based on Wichita land in so-called Texas, and I literally owe my life to the Lakota, Nakota, and Dakota peoples. For accessibility, I offer that I am a white woman with my hair pulled back. I'm wearing a black shirt with a white clergy collar, and I have a white background. I'm sharing today as a representative of Green Faith, a global multi-faith nonprofit organization. Together, our communities transform ourselves, our spiritual institutions, and society to protect the planet and create a compassionate, loving, and just world. I'm also Presbyterian, as Amy mentioned, and we've been organizing in our little corner of the faith world to divest our pensions, and I see many of the people from that decade-long struggle in the chat. Hi. I want to pause for a moment to acknowledge with silence the suffering of the people in Ukraine and all those who face the, the horror of war and violence. And so let's just pause. And may we work for peace. Since the beginning of the divestment movement, people of faith have said that in Christian terms, where our treasure is, there our hearts are also. And we know that people of all faiths and spirit are tasked with caring for and protecting the earth. We can't be faithful to our beliefs if we are making money off the fossil fuel industry, an industry that has disproportionately caused the climate crisis which has disproportionately ne negatively affected people who have been marginalized from power by colonization and racism. We cannot be faithful if we make money off the suffering of others and the earth. At Green Faith, we've been part of a global coalition of people of faith committed to divestment. 
We've been working with Operation NOAA in the UK. Hi, Volkani, I see you in the chat. Green Anglicans in Southern Africa, the Ladasa Sea Movement globally, Hindus for Human Rights, the Islamic Society of North America, World Council of Churches, and more. We've consistently supported and announced divestment commitments, and I want to just lift up one. One of these included that in October 2021, more than 20 Southern African Anglican bishops, including the Archbishop of Cape Town, three bishops of Mozambique, and the Bishop of Namibia called for immediate halt to gas and oil exploration in Africa. They said that a new era of economic colonization by fossil fuel companies is well underway and that Africa's natural habitats are being destroyed at an alarming rate through the extraction of oil and gas. Omar lifted up some of that struggle and the struggle that has expressed grave concerns about the East Africa crude oil pipeline. The fossil fuel industry has no more moral authority. At Green Faith, we're building on the divestment movement to target others who make money off of climate change and suffering. The natural world is a sacred trust which we must cherish and protect. We must do that together. We know that money and material wealth must be used to promote the shared welfare of all. Those responsible for managing financial assets are morally bound now more than ever, to take right action, to act ethically, and to respect those universal moral values. They have no more excuse. As people of diverse faiths and spiritualities, we call on the world's asset managers. We call on the world's banks and insurers to stop financing in the profoundly immoral destruction of our climate. We have to stop funding climate destruction. All people of faith and spirituality with a role in the financial system have a responsibility to take action immediately to put the world on a path to a more just and sustainable future. And together, together it's possible if we work together and listen to frontline communities. So Green Faith and our partners call on people of faith around the world to sign on to five moral standards for climate finance. Standards we're organizing around with others like the Stop the Money Pipeline Coalition to demand better from BlackRock and Vanguard and others. Today is a big celebration and together we have more work to do. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Abby. I always get me all teary-eyed when you speak. <laughs> That was beautiful. Thank you. Um, next, I am excited to introduce um, Heather Coleman from Wallace Global Fund. Heather is the Environment Program Director at Wallace Global Fund, a global philanthropic organization based in DC, whose mission is to support people powered movements to advance democracy and rights and to fight for a healthy planet. Um, prior to joining the fund, Heather served for more than 20 years at a variety of leading global and national organizations where she provided strategic leadership and management on climate and energy policy. Welcome to Heather. Hi, everyone. I first want to acknowledge that I'm on Piscataway land here in the D.C. area. Sorry for my voice, a little bit under the weather. Um, I want to note that I use she, her pronouns. Um, and uh, for those that aren't able, I, am, I have my hair pulled back, I'm a white woman. I am so thrilled to be with you all today. And in acknowledging Abby's moral call to action, I just wanna note that back in October, we had a celebration where we pulled together folks for a series of global announcements on divestment. Wallace Global Fund as a foundation is happy to sit in partnership with so many of you and so many of you as you engage your institutions from where you sit in the sectors where you sit to divest from fossil fuels and invest in a just uh, transition. And I wanna note that on that, in that set of announcements, Svetlana Romanko from the Laudato Si movement represented the global call to action within the uh, Catholic community um, she brought dozens of churches and very influential archbishops and others to the table to make announcements. And Svidlana is now under siege. Um, and I want to acknowledge that at this moment and say that these are our partners, our brothers and our sisters that are under siege. 
And I wanna ground our conversation today really in talking deeply about this social license, stripping the social license of the fossil fuel industry to operate, which is why we're all here, which is why the divestment movement got off the ground, which is why this movement is one of the biggest corporate campaigns in the history of the world. And I wanna kind of dive into this by just noting where we are historically. So Russia's invasion of Ukraine is really one of the, it's the biggest global military threat that we have faced as a global community since 9-11, since the instability that followed 9-11. And back in 2001, under the malevolent leadership of the oil and gas shell Dick Cheney, the Bush administration responded to the threats posed by Islamic extremism by doubling down on oil and gas infrastructure and production. And that crisis could have been, um, in, instead we could have accelerated the energy transition in earnest. The response could have been to accelerate the energy transition, to move us off of our addiction to fossil fuels and to avoid climate catastrophe. Instead, it moved us in the opposite direction. So this is really our second shot, this moment. We have built so much power. We've built so much momentum. And this is Gen Z's 9-11. The oil and gas industry sees that this is happening right now in real time. And just this morning on CNN, as I was watching, industry associations are calling for deeper investment in US oil and gas to fuel American jobs and to increase national security. And they're doing this because they understand that this is the moment when all of us see that our democratic, economic, and energy crises are interconnected. And they're exploiting this moment of understanding. They're doing it to tighten their stranglehold on our government, on our resources, and on our institutions. And if we do not push back decisively, this crisis will enable autocrats and kleptocrats in our own, in the US and globally, to get richer and to flourish while our democracy hangs in the balance and democracies all over the world hang in the balance. And the world burns, by the way. We all know that, looking at the IPCC report. We simply cannot let the industry drive the narrative and response like what happened in 2001. This has to be the moment when we continue to dig deep, find all of the energy that we can to continue to build upon our successes for a transition to a just, sustainable, and ener clean energy economy for all. And it must be the moment when we defend our democracy against the autocratic forces in the US that are aided and abetted by oil and gas tycoons. So how do we do this? First, I wanna say to all of you and to us as well, we stay the course. Each and every one of you continue to push divest invest campaigns from wherever you sit and keep on doing it. We need you to push for fossil fuel divestment because fossil fuels go hand in hand with anti-democratic countries and dictators and because fossil fuels are destroying our economy and our planet. But we also need you to call on all of your institutions to stop bankrolling Russian oil and gas assets and Stand has taken some good leadership on this in the last day or so. This can't just be about divestment either. All of the institutions you're all engaging also must invest at least 10% of their assets in just climate solutions. Divestment alone just isn't enough. We need to at least triple global investments in renewable energy and energy efficiency if we're going to avoid more than two degrees of warming. And we need these investments to secure reliable energy access for those around the world who are already marginalized and who will be the most impacted by the climate crisis. So, for those of you in the US, there are also critical fights literally happening right now that need your support that are adjacent to this work. Um, I'm going to put in the chat after I speak a link, um, but right now, tomorrow, there will be another vote in the Senate for Biden's slate of nominees for the Federal Reserve, and the Republicans have been holding up these votes. These are, several of them are folks who, are very much have an analysis, a financial analysis, risk analysis around climate. But also importantly, if this slate of appointees continues to be held up in the US, it's gonna be really hard to avoid a recession. The central bank needs to make really important fiscal decisions now to stabilize our economy under enormous stress. And if we go into recession, it's gonna be another opportunity for the oil and gas sector to justify more drilling. It's gonna make our jobs harder. 
So we need this vote to happen. We need it to happen tomorrow. And I wanna share this information with you and I will. And I just really wanna say again, thank you to everyone for being here. We all need to join together. We all need to acknowledge how much we've done, but how much more needs to happen in the days and weeks to come. Thank you. Incredible and powerful. Thank you so much, Heather. Um, and wrapping up our speaker um, portion of this, um, last but absolutely very not least, um, one of my favorite voices in the movement. I've been very excited to introduce um, the Reverend Lennox Yearwood Jr. from Hip Hop Caucus. Um, he is the president and CEO of Hip Hop Caucus, a minister, community activist, US Air Force veteran, and one of the most influential people in hip hop political life. Founded in 2004, Hip Hop Caucus focuses on issues impacting underserved and vulnerable communities with programs and campaigns supporting solution driven community organizing by holding elected officials accountable, shaping policy and building more diverse and powerful movements. And I will turn it over um, to Reverend Yearwood. My dear sister, thank you so much. I am coming to you likewise like Heather from the uh, Piscataway uh, territorial lands. And I'm excited to be with my brother, Bill, who who brought me into this movement. I'm not sure if I should be happy or I should, you know, make sure I should drag my back or something. I'm not sure, but he, he, he brought me into the movement from day one uh, and I'm just so blessed to be still here. Let me start with that moment. Also, let me just say to all of the panelists, it's so good to see many of you. Thank you for what you have done and what you're doing. Um, when we first started this back in 2012, myself, Bill, and many, many others, um, we were looked at as being crazy um, and that we couldn't do this, that we were trying to build off of the uh, amazing work that was done in the anti-apartheid movement. Let me just uh, stop there um, because as I'm speaking now, my dear friend Kumi Naido is burying his son, Ricky. His son died tragically. And so he was a part of this African movement. So I just wanna lift him up because as we're having these conversations, many of those in our movement have lost so much. But when me, Bill and so many others were first starting this back in 2012, we had to go back that we had, we were in a very particular time. The large climate legislation at that time, the ACES bill, the uh, Waxman Markey bill had failed in 2011 for many reasons. And then there was three things that propelled our climate movement. One of those things was the great work from Sierra Club and others with the Beyond Coal, and they're beginning to attack the coal campaigns. Um, the work of Bill and 350 and many others beginning to start the pipeline fights and engaging around Keystone and beginning to live up, particularly also indigenous voices. They had begun to realize at that time and we had a particularly white movement and we had to bring in indigenous voices and people of color to the forefront. And 350 and Bill and me others saw that. Um, and then the third piece was around divestment. I definitely wanna shout out Wallace Global Fund and people like Ellen Dorsey, who really were out there fighting both in the streets and in the suites. That was where we were 10 years ago. And where we are now, Bill had told me and many others had told me we would be at $40 trillion, I would have thought that would have meant success. If you had told me back then that we will have divested $40 trillion, that to me would have meant success, Heather. But what I realize now is that while that is success and while today is Mardi Gras, <laughs> we should celebrate. I also realized that that also, because the fossil fuel industry's business plan is a death sentence for our community and our world that we see they are suicidal, that they are literally willing to push nuclear buttons. They are literally willing to go to war. They are literally willing to kill people. And because of that, we are realizing now more than ever that we are dealing with a horrific suicidal foe. So but with that being the case, 10 years later, this is the good news. We have succeeded to get to this point. But if we get to 2032, and we are in the same position as a movement, we will not be successful. So let me just leave you with this, what I think needs to happen now. And Heather kind of hit on a little bit. 
first thing, let me just call out some names. The foundation that the philanthropic world has to themselves divest from fossil fuels. You cannot be supporting and building a movement when you yourself are getting fossil fuel money. And I know that they have been pushing that. Secondly, we as a movement have to transition quickly. Um, I am grateful that Bill brought me in, he's here, but Bill himself will tell you that having too many, particularly white men, in positions of, positions of power will not succeed in our movement. We must have what I believe is a BIWOC leaderful movement, a black, brown, indigenous, women and women of color leaderful movement to lead this movement moving forward in the next 10 years. If we don't do that, we will not succeed. The next thing is that we have to broaden our movement right now, because even though we're talking about 40 trillion, everyone should know about it, but actually not that many people do know about this success. And so we must do better at storytelling and narrative organizing to ensure that we can broaden our movement in this process. And the last thing I gotta say is this, we are now realizing that these industries from St. Petersburg to St. James Parish, down in Cancer Alley, they are willing to kill us. They are willing to do things to ensure that our communities die, have asthma, emphysema, cancer. We must treat them like this much more than social license. They are criminal. They have killed Berta Caceres in, in Honduras. They have killed so many of the, the defenders across the land in the, on the continent of Africa. They have killed, literally have put in their pollution in Detroit and in Louisiana and in, throughout our country. This is a killing machine that has to stop. So it is time for us to use this moment to rise up, to continue to organize, to mobilize, and to energize to make sure that we can cancel this horrific regime of the fossil fuel industry. This is our movement. This is where we are. We must stand up. We must gather. We must invigorate ourselves to do all we must do to stop the fossil fuel industry because it is critical at this time because we know before they fought for equality, but now we are fighting for existence. But when the people are organized, when the people are mobilized, we shall win. And I'm going to tell you something. I have never seen organized people lose to organized money. And it won't happen on our watch. So let's rise up and continue to divest and to invest in the clean energy and all power to the people. Woo! If you aren't fired up after that, I don't know what will fire you up. That was absolutely stunning. Thank you so much, Reverend. Um, as always, just brings it home. Um, oh, I want to go lock myself to a bank right now. You always make me want to do that. <laughs> um, thank you so much to our incredible speakers. I am so incredibly moved and just absolutely grateful to be colleagues with all of these folks on this call to everyone listening in today this is just this is what I, this is what we needed in this in this dark time is to come together and to keep fighting and to keep standing up for our communities um, so so much love to all of our panelists today and so much love to everyone on this call for participating it is everything um, now nothing keeps up a celebration energizes a movement and allows us to express our vision and move through grief with love like music and art. Um, so without further ado, um, I am really excited to present our virtual banner. Uh, we did this with a group of folks. We had folks sign up. This was inspired um, by my very good friend, David Solnit. Shout out to David Solnit, um, the absolute heart and soul of art in the movement. Um, so people came together and made their letters, and we spelled out fossil fuels equals 40 trillion divested. So thank you so much to everyone who participated in making this virtual banner. Um, thank you to everyone. Um, if you're interested in centering art in your organizing, I want you to keep your eyes out for an email and some social posts on the Defund Climate Chaos Week of Art Action coming up at the end of March from the one and only David Solnit. Um, so keep an eye out for that Arts Week of Action sign up. Um, we will be sharing that with all of you um, so we can show our power 
to the fossil fuel industry and the people financing them ahead of AGM season. Um, now, <laughs> before we offer some next steps um, and some calls to action, um, I am going to pass it to my most beautiful and dear friend, Lou Aya with the Peace Poets. So excited to have you here today. Lou is here to just inspire us and bring us music and the love um, that he always brings to these spaces. Lou. Thank you, Amy. Peace and power, my people. It is so good to be connected to you, to feel the inspiration that's flowing across this cyber cipher right now. I'm hype. I just want to go ahead and start with a song that's about imagination. So today I'm here on Tekelma land. People have been dreaming on this land and people have been dreaming on the land that you are on. And the reason that we have a movement is because we dare to imagine a different future. And sometimes we need to feel that in our bodies. So wherever you are today, I'm going to invite you to sing these words. The words are simple that are going to get us started. It's going to say, we've seen the future. We've seen the other side. There will be no prisons and there will be no pipelines. And today, for these five minutes, I need you to believe that with every single bit of your heart, that that is the future that's going to really happen on this planet, on this earth, in the rich tradition of ancestors who made it happen. That's what we're going to do. And the song goes like this. Don't be shy. Wherever you're at, I want to see you and feel you singing. All right, here we go. We've seen the future. We've seen the other side there will be no prisons there will be no pipelines try that we've seen the future we've seen the other side there will be no prisons there will be no i believe it now we've seen the future we've seen the other side there will be no prisons there will be no pipelines feel that we've seen the future Future, we've seen the other side. There will be no prison. There will be no pipelines. Okay, I love y'all. You're doing good. I know that you out there, you're starting to sing. You're starting to feel it little by little. But now I need you to actually use your mind's eye, the power of your imagination, to see that world as you sing it. And say, when you say we've seen it, I need you to see our kids living in that world. I need you to believe that world's going to happen outside of the windows that are in your house with everything you got, see that. We've seen the future, we've seen the other side. There will be no prisons, there will be no pipe. That's beautiful. We've seen the future, we've seen the other side. There will be no prisons, there will be no, sing it two more times. We've seen the future, we've seen the other side. There will be no prisons, there will be no pop one more. We've seen the future, we've seen the other side. There will be no prisons, there will be no pipelines. That's what I'm talking about, my people. You need to see it. And because we've been imagining it, we are realizing it is happening. And right now, I want to say something. I want to say there was a song that I wrote for a little direct action we did, 3,000 people shutting down Wall Street. It was a song called The Voice of My Great Granddaughter. And since that time, that song has been sung all over the world, basically doing this, manifesting this powerful prophecy of the people rising up as the water rises. And we're going to sing it again today. And this is our recommitment. It's a celebration because we believe in this movement. And so sing it with me. Here it go. The people going to rise like the water. We going to face this crisis now. I hear the voice of my great granddaughter saying, keep it in the ground, let's go. The people going to rise like the water, we going to face this crisis now. I hear the voice of my great granddaughter saying, keep it in the ground like you mean it. The people going to rise like the water, we going to face this crisis now, come on. I hear the voice of my great granddaughter saying, keep it in the ground, dance with it. The people going to rise like the water we gonna face this crisis now i hear the voice of my great granddaughter saying keep it in the two more times the people gonna rise like the water we gonna face this crisis now let's go i hear the voice of my great granddaughter saying keep it in the one more time the people gonna rise like the water we gonna face this crisis now i hear the voice of my great granddaughter 
saying keep it in the ground that's right my people they speaking to us our little ones are speaking to us all future generations are speaking to us i know that you can hear them and we need to hear them not just today in our celebration but tomorrow and the next day and the day after and our lives are our response every single action we take is our response thank you for the ways in which you are already rising up I see you, I love you for that. I feel you, I believe in you. I know that you're gonna keep doing it. I know you're gonna escalate this struggle. And when we talk about escalating this struggle, we think of this song, which means, which is about liberation. Because right now I need us to be rid of all our fear. We need us, our ancestors need us to be rid of all our fear, to step powerfully into this moment. And so we sing, we are not afraid. We are not afraid. We will live for liberation because we know why we were made. And we know the truth that you cannot separate black and brown liberation, poor people's liberation, queer liberation. You can't separate the liberation of people who are affected by war, who are affected by incarceration from the liberation of the trees outside our window, the liberation of the water that deserves to be free of poison. You can't separate that. And we're not afraid to fight for all of it together. And that's why we're doing it like this. Here we go. We are not afraid, we are not afraid, we will live for liberation, cause we know why we were made, sing that with me. We are not afraid, we are not afraid, we will live for liberation, cause we know why we, sing it for all the people on the front lines, we are not afraid, stopping pipelines. We are not afraid, we will live for liberation, cause we know why we were made for those in the Amazon. We are not afraid, say we are not afraid, we will live for liberation, cause we know why we were made, sing that with me. We are not afraid. We are not afraid, we will live for liberation, cause we know why we will make one more time, see, we are not afraid. We are not afraid, we will live for liberation, cause we know why we were made. We were made to do this work, my people. Love and respect to all of you. My name is Luaya from the Peace Poets. It's an honor to be with you. Thank you, we're together. Peace. Absolutely. As always, beautiful and inspiring and so grateful to have Lou in my life and in the life of the movement. Um, art and music is the heart and soul of everything that we do. Um, we're coming to the end um, of our time together today, um, but we're going to do some just some closing things. Um, we want to share this news far and wide. So there's a toolkit, there's a link going to be shared. Um, we're going to share a video um, that we had made for this special moment. Um, and we're also going to sign a petition um, to pension funds to put people over profit. Um, and just so people know, shout out to my Climate Safe Pensions Network folks who work so hard on divesting pension funds. Um, we're working with the, one of the largest institutional investors on the planet is pension funds, and they work their tails off. So we're sharing a petition today um, to help push pension funds to divest. Um, I just want to say thank you so much um, for joining today and for our incredible movement leader speakers, the art, the music, all of us taking the time out of our day today to come together, to be together, and to hold this moment as inspiration for what we will do in the future. When we started this out, when we all started, we never imagined that we would get this far and 40 trillion seems huge. Imagine what we can do together now. If we're gonna 40 trillion we've got now, I wanna see us double and triple that number. Um, so get involved, find your local divestment campaign, join a local chapter, join third act, join 350, find somewhere to sign up, get involved with this movement and help us push this forward because it is our future and our children's future that depends on it and all of our future generations. Um, so I'm gonna, we're gonna share this video now to close us out um, with so much love to all of you. Um, hugs and until our next time together, um, go get that divestment.
All right, that's the end of our video. Um, and I see lots of people saying they can't copy the chat. I totally hear you. Um, and we are hoping to, after this, we will send out a follow-up email um, with all of those links to the toolkit, to the video. Um, you can also um, follow stand.earth on social media. Um, we have a tweet, we have a Facebook post, we have other things up already for you to share. So hit those up. Um, also follow all of our amazing speakers and panelists today. Um, we will share out their social media handles so that you can follow them, join their organizations and support all of the important work that they do um, to change everything we need everyone. Um, so love you all and we'll see you soon.